welcome to Pottery Revisited, episode 42. I'm Tori. And I'm Shay. Today we are covering chapter 5 of Prisoner of Azkaban, The Dementor. Ooh. Or, as we like to call it, Harry's first kiss. Almost. Yep, so I am back from seeing Taylor Swift without Shay, and she's mad, but whatever. So mad. I'm a mad woman. Which was one of the secret songs. So we're jumping back into Harry Potter and, and not the Chamber of Secrets. Uh. Harry Potter and the Chamber of I Didn't Get to See Taylor Swift. <laughs> <laughs> we're jumping back into Prisoner of Azkaban and we start off where we left off with everyone getting ready to go back to Hogwarts. Hanging out at the Leaky Cauldron. And Ron comes to find Harry and he's just super pissed off because Percy's just been irritating him and he's like so happy to go to school and be away from Percy and then Fred and George come to congratulate Ron for irritating Percy but the thing is Percy's mad at Ron because he thinks Ron took his prefect badge and the twins did it and so the twins basically caused Ron's irritation by irritating Percy and it's just like yeah oh my gosh it never ends the shenanigans never ends and another little tidbit we find is that when Harry goes down for breakfast Mrs. Weasley is telling Hermione and Jenny about a love potion she made when she was a young girl and I still like we talked about love potions in the last book and it's just doesn't seem good it's like what is consent is basically love potion it's it's not cool it's it's a no-no I think they're like particularly like dangerous I mean first of all it should be illegal to slip someone anything that alters their state or their opinions or their behaviors without their consent so like you're drugging them not cool but also like if you're a young person drugging someone you might not be very good at potions and you could just like flat out poison them like that's also an outcome that could happen yeah like oops I killed you my bad I had two left turns of the cauldron instead of right yeah just the way they treat it in this series like even when Hermione tells Harry and like Half-Blood Prince when Romel Devane tries to like slip him a love potion she's just like oh you should be careful but it's just very much like they really diminish it as a concept in the story they really show it as something funny and giggly and often girly and like no consent is cool consent is important consent but also like i almost think like the author was like okay we need to describe what's going on in this room what what are Hermione and Ginny doing? Well they're talking to Miss Weasley. Okay, they're all women. So like what do women talk about? Like, it seemed like such a stereotypical, like, oh, they must be talking about, like, boys. And, like, if you're magic, love potions. And I'm like, there's, like, a 100,000 things they could be talking about. Like, Ginny is so smart for her age. Hermione is incredibly intelligent. Miss Weasley's awesome. Like, have them talk about something awesome. Like, it's just, like, such a, like, lazy... It felt like a lazy writing. Like, oh, they're talking about love potions. I'm like, gross. That's gross. Yeah, usually the tidbits that we get in, like, background scenes while Harry's ent- entering are usually pretty fun. But this one's just kind of like, ugh. Back at the gross love potions again. Yikes in the yard. Yeah, so we kind of get more of Mr. Weasley is really guarding Harry in this scene. As, like, they get the ministry cars to come, Mr. Weasley is, like, guiding Harry, like, by the arm into the car, getting him in the car. And then also when they get to King's Cross, Mr. Weasley is taking Harry by the arm and leading him into the platform. Yeah, it's very, uh smothering but also i guess arthur weasley has been given a big responsibility well he's not outright like harry you know he's guarding him but it's also arthur is like his father figure at this point too like i feel like it feels more um i don't know it doesn't feel as like such guarding as like later on in the series where harry is kind of really irked by it because it's not like mad eye moody or tonks or someone that's obviously in order and they're just there to guard him but mr weasley obviously cares about him and he's kind of treating him as like yeah his son basically yeah he doesn't just want harry not dead he actually cares about harry's well-being which is such a rarity for adults in this series yes very true and we have Percy uh, going to see his girlfriend, which is so funny. <laughs> and he describes it as him just like puffing out his chest so like his girlfriend can see his head boy badge and everything. I mean, he's proud of it. He's peacocking. Yeah, and also it's like he, it's he's like how old at this point? He's like seventeen, so like you know, like wants to seem impressive to his girlfriend. And also, his girlfriend probably appreciates his um, what he's passionate about as well, because she's also had girl. Yeah, yeah, like they're they have mutual 
interests in like being ambitious and being good students and, you know, being respected and getting positively reinforced for their hard work and their efforts. I get it. She's probably the only one in his life who's enthusiastic about him having achieved something that's pretty impressive. So exactly. he's probably so hyped to finally see her and they can actually celebrate. Yeah, finally has someone that respects him and appreciates his uh, achievement. Yeah. I do find it interesting that it's Harry and Ginny that are kind of bond like laughing and to get together, but Percy being just like, you know, this embarrassing teenage boy because after everything that happened in the last book like Ginny still is very embarrassed and not really talking to Harry but the, they have this like mutual moment where they like this is like, like hilarious where they kind of bond over that so you still kind of get that Ginny's kind of like you know getting back to normal and we're seeing more of her character yeah it's nice to see more of Ginny and it's also nice that they're bonding Harry and Ginny it's early and they're just friends and it's not a thing but it's like they're sharing it together it's definitely getting more more Ginny which is nice. Which is nice. She's such a badass in the books. It's coming. Just you wait. <laughs> I love her. So be- before they get on the train, Mr. Weasley pulls Harry aside, wanting to tell him that, you know, Sirius Black is after him. But Harry already knows this. Harry's like, yep. Because he overheard it accidentally. But when Mr. Weasley's kind of like stressing to him, like, you gotta be careful. You, you, you can't be going out and doing crazy things. Harry's just like not really bothered. And Mr. Reese is like, aren't you scared? And Harry is like, not really. Yeah, he's just like, it's as normal, you know, it's fine. Yeah. Just Harry being Harry. Which is, it's just like so casual, but like you do get it when Harry just like thinks, like when he, we ended the last chapter where he thinks that Sirius Black can be worse than Voldemort, another mass murderer that's out to get him. So I mean like, it's chill. To Harry, it's not really that big of a deal. Someone's always after him. It's, the, it's like, you know, same story different villain it's fine he's 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 used to this this is the norm this is just another day in the life of harry potter but the one thing mr weasley says to harry which he's kind of confused by is that he tells harry not to go after sirius black and harry's just like well why would i go after someone who wants to kill me because at this point yeah voldemort has just been coming after him and he's just like dealing with it he doesn't go after mass murderers he's not that like have that much of a death wish yeah that's such a tease though like to me if i'm a teenager and someone says specifically don't do this thing you have not yet considered doing i'd be like why now i kind of want to do the thing well that's why like i wonder why no one thought to tell him about the connection between Sirius black and his parents because if harry was like you know someone that was actually like confused about this and maybe if he had more time to consider this, he might have actually gone to research why he would want to go after Sirius Black and find the connection of himself. Because they spent their whole first year trying to find out who Nicholas Fumel was just because Hagrid told him this random name. Yeah, there. Uh... So like, if Harry didn't have other things going on in this book, I'm sure he could have gone by like, why? Who is Sirius Black and why is he after me? He's trouble. Because I just feel it would have been better to hear it from Mr. Weasley or just someone close to him rather than hear it from the way he hears it in the book like offhandedly yeah absolutely i just think everyone seems to think the best way to handle harry is like keeping the secrets and it never works out like at some point they just need to accept that he deserves to know you think that they would learn that harry's just really nosy and that he will spend all his time looking for clues for something like his very first year like they didn't even know how nicholas flamel was like involved in anything they just heard the name and they're just like oh we're gonna find out who this is let's google it that's wizard google aka library <laughs> yeah so it just feels like it would have been better coming from mr weasley so harry's just kind of like aware because i feel like that but people are worried about harry and getting into trouble and Sirius Black finding him, but like, I feel like it's, it kind of opens Harry up for some confusion. Yeah, a lot of confusion. And like, again, he's just like wetting his interests. Yeah. Like, just don't mention it at all or tell him everything he needs to know. Don't give him a teaser. <laughs> like, but that's basically the whole series. It's just everyone teasing Harry with bits of information and just not giving him the full truth. Making him spend half a book figuring it out. <laughs> yeah looking at you Dumbledore looking at you <laughs> but anyway uh, Harry wants to tell Ron Hermione about this information that he tried to tell Ron earlier so Ron's just like Ginny go away and I felt so bad for Ginny because I'm thinking that like this is her first year back after all of her last first year which was absolutely terrible where she was basically attacking students and obviously it wasn't her fault but we don't know what the general population of Hogwarts thinks about her and I don't really know if she's actually made any friends because she spent most of the year being possessed and I just feel like she was very close to Ron, obviously, as, like, her closest brother to age. And likely wanted to, like, hang out with him because she's also been very close with Hermione, too. Yeah. She, like, leaves. And like, we don't know where she went, but I don't even know if she has friends or anything. So it just feels like she's off on her own. And Yup. 
off on her own again. It's really hard to be Ginny. I just think that this is a, a really hard year for Ginny. So until she kind of establishes herself, but like... Maybe she has like a cool reputation for being having been kidnapped by evil and like almost died. Like maybe that's fun and exciting to the other kids at Hogwarts. You know? Maybe. I just feel like that she's probably anxious about it because she didn't make any like solid friendships and after everything, like she doesn't know how people are going to react yet. Yeah. And then I just feel like she's kind of being like forced to go put herself in an unknown social situation because Ron won't let her sit with them. Yeah, you can't sit with us. But I do get like being like a sibling and being like, I want my own friends. Yeah, get your own friends, you annoying little sister. All I can think of is Ginny in a very Potter musical. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's the vibe. And so we find out that Professor Lupin is in Harry and Ron Hermione's compartment and I'm just wondering why he decided to ride the train. Yeah, I think I, as like a, a student, a child on a train, would be hella sus about an unidentified sleeping adult just like on this train full of children. I'd be like, why are you here? Who are you here? Like, what are your credentials? Are you sure you're supposed to be here? Like, are you allowed to be unsupervised around the children? Are you supervising the children because you're asleep? <laughs> Like, I would not... It also feels weird that he's in, like, a random, uh, like, compartment because we know that the, the prefects have, like, their own compartment in the train, which I assume is close to, like, where, like, the driver is. And I'm assuming if, like, teachers wanted to ride the train, they'd be in, like, their own compartment, like, not just, like, hanging out with the kids. Yeah, I don't think I would want to be hanging out with the kids. In fact, I think... The only thing I can think of is um, kind of, like, a fandom I don't know that this isn't, like, canon or anything. It's just, like, head canons I've seen is that, like... He wants to ride the train because he's going back to school and it has all these like memories of like the marauders with it. And also I've seen people theorize that the compartment that he's in could have been the compartment that James and Sirius and Peter and him all rode to school in. So he just wanted to go back to like that moment and then unintentionally Harry just kind of shows up there and it's just kind of like this weird kind of fate or something. I just think if he's there for nostalgia, he wouldn't be sleeping. He'd be staring out the window whimsically. He's not very well, though, so I would assume he just wanted to write it for the nostalgia and, like, kind of, like, fell asleep or whatever. Yeah, I guess. I wonder how close the full moon is around this time. We could, You could probably check. I mean, we know what day Hogwarts starts. We know it's the day before Hogwarts school starts, and we approximately know what year it is. We could Google it and know how far away the moon is. So they start their third year at Hogwarts in 1993. And since the first day at school is on September 1st, that means this day that this is happening is the last day of August. And I've checked and it is one day before the full moon, meaning the first day of school September 1st will be a full moon. So that could explain why Lupin isn't feeling well. That makes so much sense, looking back on it. Well, when they're in the compartment and Lupin's asleep and they're all getting settled, Harry's sneakoscope goes off. And I'm wondering, does it go off because of Peter Pettigrew being there? Yeah, I think it could because he's undercover, he's disguised, he's being nefarious. But I also think maybe Lupin isn't asleep anymore and he's kind of eavesdropping. Yeah. And I feel like that, even though Lupin is a good guy, eavesdropping on a conversation you're not a part of is still nefarious. I just feel like Ron was with Harry with Scabbers a lot of the time. I know that he kept the sneakoscope in his trunk, but why wouldn't have it have gone off when Ron came into Harry's room at the beginning of the chapter? Yeah. With I'm assuming he always carries Scabbers with him. So I just feel like it, they were also talking about like mischievous things so maybe because ron does say it's a cheap one so he doesn't think it's like super accurate but yeah i think it's most, mostly meant to be taken as a hint that something kind of bigger is going on than we than we think it is yeah i would like to know i would be nice to know sneak scopes are one of those like weird vague wizarding tools like kind of like a remember all in that like you know something's up but it doesn't really help you specifically like a sneak scope works like a compass like it spun when something happened and then pointed at the person who was nefarious that would be cool but like it's kind of just like anxiety inducing <laughs> if it goes off non-specifically and like do those things have a radius draco's on the train it could be going off because draco's there we don't know yeah we know that the, the fake moody says and like all the fire he doesn't like do sneakoscopes at the school because it's always going off because everyone's always lying the teenagers i can see it coming off just because of that some solid advice from fake moody to be honest yeah i also kind of love that 
when they find out that Harry can't go into Hogsmeade, Ron's just like, why? He won't attack you. Me and Hermione will be there. And like in his mind, he's totally like, me and Hermione are there. So like this serial killer grown man who escaped prison totally won't do anything. And like, I love that that's how Ron's mind works. It's like, it's totally fine. And I love that Hermione's mind works in the, no, Ron, that's dumb. He's a serial killer. He doesn't care. He kills grown people. We are 13 years old. We will not d- deter the serial killer. But Ron's just like, no, no, we're so me and me and Hermione. <laughs> totally going to scare him off. Yeah, it's classic, classic Ron. <laughs> but I'm sure it, it really sucks for Harry to hear them talk about all the things they can do at Hogsmeade. And Harry just has to sit there knowing that he can't go. Yeah, they probably should have... Ex- like checked if he could earlier on like as soon as they start talking about it because they know what his home life is like they should be like did they sign the form before they go into how cool Hogsmeade is be like oh I'm excited for Hogsmeade me too Harry are you coming I feel like Harry doesn't go into like the really big depths about how bad his like the jerseys are so they know that they don't you know they don't get on and like they're not really likable or they're mean and stuff but i don't think ron or money are like un- uh, they don't understand why the jerseys wouldn't sign the form because they have good parents yeah because i feel like if you have, have like a really good relationship with your parents when people don't it's hard to imagine yeah especially if you don't know all the details i do feel like harry doesn't share like, he says offhand and things but i don't think he really point blank says the jerseys are abusive to me i mean ron knows that there were bars on his window and <laughs> Yeah, that's true. That seems pretty fire hazardy, aka abuse. It's hard to know though. Starting into our Crookshanks versus Scabbers debacle, I do. I always feel like I really identified with Hermione having this cat because I am just a crazy cat lady, and I'm here for Crookshanks and all. But now that I'm also like at my, like a, my own pet owner, like I just don't have a pet, like a family pet. It's like my pet, and I take, I am in control of it. I take care of it. I am in charge of it. Whatever. I do feel like Hermione doesn't really do that good of a job of like um, keeping Scabbers and Crookshanks kind of like in check. Like she has to know that Crookshank's a cat. Cats view mice as, or rats as prey. And Ron's calling her up being like, keep the cat away from me. Like I have my rat here. And I feel like she's just very blaze about it. Yeah. And I do feel like she's just very, she, she doesn't take it as seriously as I think she should have. Like it obviously ends up being Peter Pedigree, but it's this thing. It's like, that's her friend's like lifelong pet. And like, I know you just got a pet and you love it and you don't want him anyone to hurt it and you don't really it's like her baby basically yeah but i'm like like it's your responsibility to like be keeping the cat away or making sure it's not doing anything it shouldn't be doing you have to be conscientious of it and she isn't the most conscientious of it but also she's 13 i i probably couldn't have been a responsible pet owner at 13 it's kind of crazy when you think that they let these kids that show up at 11 have a pet that they bring to school because like there's responsibilities involved with that that are a lot yeah I get small pets because I feel like growing up we had like hamsters and stuff and that's like a pretty easy thing to take care of you just have to remember to feed it every day but yeah these are like some serious pets that you need to take care of like do they what happens when their pets get sick or whatever yeah what happens when your cat eats someone's rat or toad what happens when your owl eats someone's cat like so Malfoy comes as he always does just to antagonize everyone in the compartment and I'm just thinking like he literally does this every single book mm-hmm. or he's done it like the, the first book and the second book but I think even in the books after this he always comes up to Harry on the train just to antagonize him and I'm just like yeah he's like what is the point time to get Potter's year off to a bad start <laughs> as is tradition like he literally goes close looking out for this it's just like the highlight of his journey every year he's like I'm gonna go antagonize Potter just to I don't know if he gets some kind of validation or like... I think Draco is very conscientious of like status and like he has a lot of status at home in the world as a pureblood, but like he wants to have a, a higher status among the students. And I think in his mind, asserting his dominance over Harry Potter, who's a pretty popular, well-liked, powerful wizard, is like his way of like placing himself there or trying to make it appear like he belongs above Harry on like the hierarchy of school social status. Yeah, I know that Muffet does this every year and every year they're always like besting him or whatever. But I do feel like he kind of moves away from insulting Harry. Like he always insults Harry, whatever. But I do think like he knows that Ron's very sensitive about like anything. So he just really picks on Ron, especially in like the this book and the next book. Yeah, what a dick. And yeah, so we see that like Ron's feelings about Malfoy are just very charged this year. Like he he he's threatening Malfoy. He said if Malfoy like talks shit about his family this year, he's just gonna like 
wring his neck or whatever, he's explaining Hermione, and Hermione's just like, you need to, like, take a step back, like... There's a teacher here. <laughs> yeah, but I feel like her, like, Ron is just, is he's getting over more aggressive towards Malfoy, like, Malfoy's really getting under his skin this year, and I'm wondering if it's just how the age that uh, Ron's at, he's a 13, and now this is kind of, like, the time where, like... Hormones, endorphins... He's just feeling, like, really feeling his anger and his like pride and everything or is it because he's aware of what the Malfoys have done to Ginny in the last year and that's just kind of like made him even more distaste like more disdain towards the Malfoys I think it's both they've personally screwed over his family and he's mad but they're also shit talking his family and that also makes him mad so I feel like the Malfoys decided they wanted beef with the Weasleys and Ron's just coming to terms with like they want beef with my family this is the way it is I must you know, do my part in the family long-standing feud with the Malfoys. I must thwart Draco. Watch out, Draco. Well, Draco will get his uh, comeuppance in this book. Just not by Ron. <laughs> How unexpected. So the train is suddenly coming to a stop and everyone's confused because they're not at the school yet and everything goes dark and... Obviously, we find that the Dementors have come onto the train. And it just seems so irresponsible because there's no warning. Not even, like, the teachers or the conductor or anyone knows. Everything's pitch black with a train full of students. No one knows, knows what's going on. I don't think half the students know what a Dementor is. And it just seems like... I think either the Dementors weren't supposed to board the train. Like, they were just supposed to be flying around nearby in case the train is attacked. And they probably sensed something and went aboard with their weird Dementor senses. And shouldn't have, but they didn't seek permission because they're like, they're Dementors. They don't want to seek permission. They want to go around eating souls. Um, but I also think maybe it just wasn't expected to go that way. Like, I can see how if I take away what Dementors are and just think big, burly security type guys, I could see them doing a look down the train to make sure there's no one hiding on there or like using advanced magic to check if someone on the board is not who they're supposed to be using polyjuice potion, whatever. Like I understand the logic and the safety level of it, but like, I don't think it should have been Dementors that did that. I think searching the train is a good idea. I think it should have been someone like a human being, like an aura or something that did that because the Dementors have such a huge psychological impact on everyone in their vicinity. And like, these are teenagers leaving their parents' house. There's first years on that train. Like, it's so unhealthy to have something that's just, like, literally the embodiment of, like, depression and sadness and fear walking around the children is a terrible idea. So I really think they should have, like, got an aura to do it. Yeah, I get the idea that they're, like, searching. And I do think, like, this kind of shows the con the amount of control the ministry has over it. Because I know Cornel Cornelius Fudge is letting them do whatever because he wants to catch Black. But, like, I feel like they just kind of do things and he's just, like, okay with it because he's really feeling the pressure to catch Black. But we obviously get that this wasn't, like, what was supposed to happen. Yeah, it was not ideal. But I do feel like if once, like, the... the conductor or something knew that the mentors were coming on the train they should put like an announcement over being like stay in your carriage yeah but i mean maybe there's not much you can do like you stop there's dementors if i'm the conductor my options are tell the children dementors are boarding the train and they're all gonna freak the heck out or i don't know it's a tough situation yeah but like if we know that the dementors searching the train wasn't planned that means they didn't plan someone to search the train and i think that's irresponsible <laughs> They should have absolutely had an adult, human-ish, non-dementor searching the train for imposters and danger. But, you know, that's just my perspective. Negligence. The dementors wouldn't have had to search the train if someone else responsible was searching the train. Everything's negligent in the wizarding world. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> but so the mentor comes into the compartment with Harry and Ron and Hermione, and Lupin's, like, there... And this is where Harry's kind of like feeling the the chill that just goes into like his heart, like it's in his soul basically. And when he hears this like screaming in like the back of his head, where it's like someone pleading, and then he wakes up and and he's like on the ground, so he's obviously passed out. And he pretty much almost had his first kiss. How romantic. A Dementor. But I'm just wondering, like, what would have happened if Lupin was not there? Because he really took hold of the situation where, I guess, like, the Dementors were really coming at Harry, which they weren't supposed to do. They're supposed to be searching for Sirius Black. 
And he basically forced them to leave because he told them to leave. They wouldn't leave. So he forced them to leave. And then obviously Harry had like a very bad reaction. So he was able to like get them all chocolate and like help them. I think if Lupin wasn't there, Hermione would have had to do something because I don't think the Dementor was ready to let go of Harry. And I think everyone else would be panicked. And I mean, Hermione, or I think Ron, realistically, Ron would say, Hermione, do something. And then Hermione would, she doesn't know a Patrona. She'd like Lumos in its face or something and hope it drops its connection. Like do a bat bogey hex, whatever she has. You know what I, I think they would try something because I don't think it would have let go of Harry on its own. Or Ginny just punches it. <laughs> She's like, that's my man. <laughs> Speaking of Ginny, uh, we get like, um, when the, the lights are off before Harry is kind of like passes out, we, we hear like all these people. So Neville comes into their apartment freaked out. And then Ginny comes because she was looking for Ron, which I thought was really sweet that she was looking for her older brother because she was freaked out. Yeah, I wonder if she was looking for Ron because he's like the most emotionally supportive of her siblings. Or if she was looking for Harry because Harry's a big hero who saves people all the time well, i do think compared to like all she has is fred and george who i feel like wouldn't take the situation seriously no they wouldn't and i think she like, percy would also make it, it too serious yeah like, i feel like he treats her as a child and ron's more her age so he won't treat her like an inferior like i think percy would over coddle her ron's definitely the best choice I just wonder if it's just Ron that she's going for or also like Harry and Hermione. Because also like when weird things happen, it's almost always those three. (laughs) So like she's like something's up, they'll know or it'll be happening in front of them and I can find out what's going on. But I do agree Ron is definitely the most emotionally supportive of the um, Weasleys on that train for Ginny to go to. And also like he saved her last year. Like Ron went down into that chamber to try and save her. That's why I do think that they have a pretty close connection compared to the other brothers. Like, she obviously loves all her brothers, but, like, Ron's their closest in age, and I think they just have a closer bond. None of them almost died to save her. Slackers. (laughs) You know? Absolute slackers. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) But um, there's also this moment where um, Lupin's kind of uh, talking to them all, giving them chocolate, and then he says Harry's name, and Harry's just really confused how Lupin knows his name. And I'm, since we know, obviously, how Lupin knows Harry... And not just because it's Harry Potter. I'm just wondering what was going through his mind seeing Harry face to face for the first time. Because I don't think he's probably seen Harry since he was a baby. So just seeing like a full, basically a uh, young version of James staring back at him with all his eyes. That's got to like really be like a punch in the gut. First of all, I think it's really funny that Harry is shocked that Lupin knows who he is because he's Harry Potter. Like we've already established for two books, everybody in the Wizarding World knows who you are. You have a very distinct look. You've been in the newspaper. And he's like, how do you know my, like, could you imagine like getting on a train and sitting down next to Michelle Obama and her and and you being like, oh, hi, Michelle Obama. And her being like, how do you know my name? (laughs) And you're like, you know. I do wonder if it was the way he said his name, because the way I always read it is that it's it, it seems familiar. And Carrie is used to people knowing him like on the surface, like his name and stuff, but not really seeing like they know him like well. Mm. So like he said it with like a sensitive tone, almost like Harry and not Harry. So maybe he just got a, a feeling that like Lupin seemed to know him. So I think it's kind of foreshadowing to the fact that Lupin seems there's more to Lupin that we like then really meets the eye he's not just a new professor there's something important there and then we also get the fact that jenny was also very shaken up by the dementor since harry was kind of like you know kind of embarrassed that he was the only one that passed out but then he said that neville was really freaked out ron and hermione also weren't happy and jenny actually starts to sob a little bit so i just thinking like the things that jenny must have like seen or felt would have been pretty scary i mean yeah she was possessed and she almost died so she has like a recent trauma that's actually pretty terrifying. Yeah, just thinking of like how recent her trauma is, I think that the dementia must have really affected her. And that's why she went to Ron, probably. And she, because she was that scared. And she, just poor Ginny. They don't kind of gloss over the trauma she's faced. And we don't really get a um, lot about it until she's, until she's a lot older and or the Phoenix when she kind of explains about the possession tells harry he's a dumbass <laughs> yeah tells harry to shut up but um i didn't even get therapy harry 
No one, no one gets therapy in the wizarding world. God damn, they should all be in therapy. <laughs> Everyone should be in therapy here. Well, despite all those shocks, they do make it to Hogwarts in one piece. Mostly one piece. And this is like the first reference you get of the carriages that take the older students to the school because Harry took the car last year for Ron, so we didn't get this information. But Harry describes them as carriages that are like pulled by invisible horses, he says. Which is really interesting because we actually find out that Cestrals that are pulling them later on. And then Harry feels kind of woozy still because he passed out and then also the Dementors are all around the school so he keeps, he doesn't feel great. Yeah. And of course Malfoy finds out finds out because uh, I think he said Longbottom told him. I wonder why Neville would tell anyone. I like- feel like Neville was over, was telling someone, like probably like Dean or Seamus or something and it just kind of came up in conversation and, and Malfoy overheard. I don't think I would, I mean... I guess they're like 13, but I don't think I would tell anyone if something like that happened to my friend. I'm sure he didn't mean it to be malicious. It just wasn't something he thought about. Yeah, Neville's never malicious. I just like feel like he just kind of tells things how it is. I also just think someone having like a fainting reaction is like a really big deal when you're that young. Like it doesn't happen to young people very often. But as someone who has passed out in public, it is kind of embarrassing and, and really awkward and stuff. So... I really do feel for Harry. We both fainted at the same place. I mean, I passed at other places too, but uh, we both passed out at work. <laughs> I think it was like within the same month too. We both fainted. And a uh, fun me and Tori fact. And uh, she fainted in front of customers. So they sent her home and I fainted not in front of customers. So they made me stay. <laughs> How sketchy. Tell us about your sketchy first job. <laughs> Poor Harry just passing out. And then uh, um, McGonagall pulls uh, Hermione and Harry in to have a talk. And basically they bring in Madame Pumphrey. And, he- and Harry just feels like 10 times worse because she's like, oh, maybe you should stay in the hospital wing and they're just like coddling him and harry's just like oh my god no please no leave me alone stop embarrassing me (laughs) he's like what will malfoy think if i stay in the hospital wing the first night back and it's just very much like the things you would worry about as a teenager and like having like something really embarrassing happen to you and everyone knowing about it and how they perceive you yeah because harry does not want to be perceived as delicate which is hilarious because like you didn't die you were supposed to have died a while back and you didn't so you're very undelicate i did find it interesting that madame pumphrey when he explains that professor lupin gave him chocolate she's really impressed and i feel like madame pumphrey and professor lupin should have a very good like almost kind of like friendship after because all the time that he spent in the hospital when growing up. Yeah, they're probably pals. She's like, this guy's cool. She seems very impressed with him. I got So we know how much she didn't like Lockhart. So I feel like it was kind of a snub being like, we finally have a professor who knows his remedies. Competent person. And also, I think for her specifically, most people completely disregard her job in that they blatantly let students break themselves all the time, knowing that it's going to end that way. And it's so nice for her to be like, hey, this guy. Someone who actually cares. He wants the students to be not sick, not in pain, not hurting. He did a thing to help them. I didn't know that was possible. (laughs) Working at this school with this headmaster? (laughs) Shocking. And when Harry leaves, we obviously know that Hermione and McGonagall are talking about her times table. Mm -hmm. And something, it just like, we know that she gets the time turner here. And I just feel that someone should have been looking out for Hermione's like mental health because I get that she's very ambitious and she's very academic and she wants to take all these courses, but that someone at some point has to say, okay, you can't take this many courses because it's too big of a workload. You have to pick and choose. Yeah, like even if she can time travel back to like go to more classes, does that mean she's also time traveling to get extra hours to study and do homework? Because there's only so many hours in the day. And at that point, like you're going to be so tired because you were still physically awake for whatever, 36 hours. You know what I mean? Like your body is still going to be tired. Yeah, and it's the fact that also it's like one thing if she was an adult and she's consenting to this, but she is a child and... I just feel like there's no safeguarding around this. They're just like, oh, Hermione's, because she had to get special permission. And so like, all the, obviously all the teachers were like, yeah, this is fine. But obviously we know that this kind of like made her go insane and like she really struggled. Yeah, she was stressed. She was overworked. And I just feel like someone should have been looking out for her because she didn't have like the capacity to think about how this would affect her brain. She was just thinking that all the classes that she wanted to learn, like she just... All she wanted was to learn, but someone like had to be there being like, okay, this is not possible. 
you need to like, this is how many classes you you can take, you have to pick. And she just had to make a decision. Again, no one was looking out for her, which is dumb. Yeah, I agree. I agree. They shouldn't have like, absolutely, she's going to want to take everything if they're going to try. It's like if your kid goes into an ice cream shop unattended, they're going to try every flavor because that's so fun and exciting. You need someone to keep you there from throwing up. And it's like, she's nauseous and throwing up all year because they let her have all the flavors. Yeah, I had the same kind of experience where in college, like we had to pick like specialization courses and there were courses I wanted to take, but I could not physically take because they're at the same time as some of my other classes. So you really have to like, it's just like, you kind of have to decide like what you what you really want to do. Obviously, if I could have cho- chosen, I would have chosen like all the classes I wanted to take, but I had to pick the classes that would work with my times table. So yeah, and it honestly worked out because like you don't want like a super big course load. Like, you need time to, like, you know, sleep, eat, exist. Have fun. But Hermione wasn't thinking of that, obviously, because she's 13. And you don't think about, like, time management and stuff like that at that age. I wonder if, like, because they do a lot of dumb stuff for people to learn lessons. at all. Like, not class lessons, but life lessons. I wonder if, like, there was maybe at some point one responsible adult involved in this situation who was like, I need to teach Hermione the lesson of just because you could possibly do the most doesn't mean that's always the right choice. Like wanted Hermione to learn the life lesson of maybe this is the wrong choice and wanted the teachers who approved it to learn the life lesson of oops, we also made the wrong choice. And like, because I think the amount of people that needed to approve this kind of thing is a lot. And it's very concerning to think all of them saw no flaw in it. Yeah, all of them were like, yeah, that's fine. I'm hoping one of them was like, she's going to get worn out and exhausted and tired and be stressed. And it's going to show and it's going to impact her life and everyone's going to see that. But if everyone else is not willing to notice that, I'm going to let them see it, you know? I think that's one thing to do if she was a bit older, but I feel like because she was so young, I feel like someone should have stepped in. Like if she was 16 or 17 and she thought she could do it, be like, yeah, maybe, because she's basically, like, that's the time you really take control of your own life and then you see what you're capable of. At 13, like, you think you can do everything, but you cannot. Yeah. You don't have a concept of that at that time. And I feel like learning, like, selecting courses within the timetables available to you is kind of, like, an, an important, like, step in maturing as, like, as a person like I find like most of your life when you're young you don't get to make choices that have any repercussions because your parents make those choices so it kind of feels like Hermione missed out on like an important experience of like self-discovery prioritizing making choices with impact by just being told you can have all of them like they took that opportunity away from her kind of the ability to sit there and say do I really think divination is something I'm interested in and she just didn't have to do that. I feel like her mind definitely just didn't want to miss out on anything. But I feel like she definitely, it would have been good for her to prioritize, like, what do you actually want to learn? And what just is something you just don't want to miss out on? Because you can look into concepts that you were you don't really want to take as a subject, but you can still learn about them. You can do the readings. <laughs> for fun if you want i guess yeah she's literally taking muggle studies just because she wants to learn it through the wizarding perspective but she could kind of just ask ron <laughs> yeah obviously this is hogwarts so they don't care about the students and their mental health <laughs> no they're like imagine how impressive we'll look on like the annual examinations if we have a student that took 75 classes this year we're gonna look so good i wonder how many students like if hermione's like the first person they let do this or if any other students have done this before well we've learned that we know at some point how many owls uh percy got and it's more than a timetable would allow so percy most likely had to have a time turner in order to achieve canonically the amount of owls they say he got we know that hermione ends up with 10 owls and she does that having a time turner for one year and we know that both percy weasley and bill weasley had 12 owls each which means that they also likely needed to have a time turner in order to attend all of those classes. Interesting. Yeah. So either that's a screw up by the author, which wouldn't surprise me, but I don't hate (laughs) that if they give Hermione a time turner, Percy also seems like the same type of student that they would. He's very responsible, more so than Hermione. He doesn't get in trouble like he, I think it makes sense. Well, we come into, the sorting's already happened, so we get no, no sorting hat new song until next book. Poor Harry never gets to see the sorting. But we get to see the new teachers. And so Professor Lupin is introduced as the new Defense Against the Dark Arts teacher. And Ron nudges Harry to look at how Snape's reacting. Because obviously we know that Snape wants the Dark Arts job. But Harry notes that he looks like, he doesn't look like with hatred at Lupin. It's complete other loathing. 
the way that he looks at Harry. So we're kind of getting like some foreshadowing that the fact that they either know each other or there's something deeper going on with how angry Snape is. I mean, it's hard because like I like Lupin and I think Lupin was probably the least bullyish of the people in the James Potter crew back in the Marauder days. But to the same extent, he was a bystander at least to all of the bullying Snape went through. And Snape hasn't gotten over that. So as much as like, I wish he could have gotten over it a little bit and been more of a functioning person. He just never got past it. So for him, it's this person who, you know, had a huge negative impact on his life, mistreated him, encouraged others to mistreat him as far as he knows, and partook in the saddest elements of his life. So it's just kind of like, who invited this guy? Like, Hogwarts is Snape's home, too. I mean, he has his sad little house in Spinner's End, but, like, Hogwarts is his home, too. And someone invited his, like, bullies to him, his house. Well, it's misdirected anger because Dumbledore is the one that brought him in. He's like, God damn it, Dumbledore. Not only will you not give me the job I want, you hired a guy you know I hate and have personal issues with for said job. I feel like with the, with the relationship between Remus and Snape, it's different though, because I feel like Remus was never outwardly, like he, obviously he was a bystander and he admits that. But we also know that, that Snape tried to out him as a werewolf during his like the time at Hogwarts as well. Like he's telling Lily all about this. And I feel just like half of it was obviously Snape is biased because he was raised by a pureblood witch who in turn raised him to be afraid of werewolves and installed the prejudice of werewolves in him. Part of it was also just kind of wanting to get one at James's friend because they're harassing him. And it just like became this like vicious cycle of them trying to like one up each other. Yeah, I think I think it was just he wanted to have something he could use against them because they were using all these things against him, which is not cool. And it's very childish and incredibly immature to out someone's like health issue, you know? which is kind of how I see werewolfism. It's a health concern. It's no one's business as long as he's managing it properly and not biting people. But I can totally see how a teenager would find that out and be like, ha, finally, I have something to use against you, you know? But I also, I know he also outs Lupin at the end of this book, which is why Lupin can't keep the job. And I think there's a part of me that like, Lupin is like definitely the best defense against the dark arts teacher, but he does get loose as a werewolf and almost attack students. So like, as much as I want Lupin to stay as a teacher, they did not do the best job of like, making sure he could do it in a safe way. So like, it kind of feels like Lupin totally could be a teacher at Hogwarts, but not with an asshole headmaster like Dumbledore. <laughs> like you need to have a grown up in charge if you're gonna have a teacher that could be a risk to students. I also think he probably should have had someone that's not safe making the potion. I just feel like it just created resentment. Yeah, I mean- But Dumbledore always does that. Like he just like puts Snape and other people in these situations that aren't really the healthiest. Like, yeah, Snape's on his side because he's basically being being like pressured and blackmailed into being Dumbledore's puppet and like he knows how Snape's feelings about this but he still kind of makes him do things and I just feel like it just breeds resentment that Snape just like kind of explodes at one point absolutely despite not liking him like you can't really blame him for just getting super petty and and mean because like he's just been forced to do all these things and he like ma he makes the potion he doesn't not make the potion he does the thing but absolutely Dumbledore is really kind of pushing his luck by pushing Snape all the time like I know it's a difficult potion but I guarantee you can buy it pre-made you know he Dumbledore like pushes Snape a lot like he intentionally makes Snape take on more things than are Snape's usual spy duties or potion master duties to like almost like Dumbledore always wants to know how much crap that Snape would be uncomfortable with or unhappy about, he can put Snape through. Like he's testing his loyalty at all times by just being like, what if I did this? What if I kicked you in the face? <laughs> like, he's just like- A weird test. Every day. It's like he's constantly testing Snape by being a dick to Snape. It sounds like Dumbledore. So we also find out that Hagrid has been promoted to uh, care magical creatures teacher as well as also being groundskeeper, of course. And I'm just wondering, like, what is the requirement to teach at Hogwarts? Because obviously here in Canada, like all teachers need to have like a certification to teach. And I do know in college, like I went to like an arts college. So all of the teachers didn't, weren't teachers by trade. They were professionals in the industry I was in. And so they had like their, their, um, 
experience to back up like not really being a teacher but i just feel like if you're going to teach children i feel like you probably should have some kind of teaching degree yeah i mean i guess like there's no such thing as degrees in the wizarding world like there's no post-secondary education mcgonagall when she describes like how she got her job and whatever i think to umbridge later on that she had like a certain amount of experience like she left school and got a certain amount of experience in whatever she was doing yeah she was working at the ministry of magic so i feel like you have to have a certain amount of experience in something before you become a teacher i do get that hagrid has like an interest in magical creatures he he definitely knows a lot about magical creatures i wouldn't question his his knowledge on it i would question his fitness to supervise children you can be like the smartest person in this field of study but that doesn't mean you can teach it like i had some professors that were like really great at what they were doing but like the way they they couldn't convey things very well because teaching is like it's basically like a calling or like an art like it's it's to be a good teacher like had to have a lot of skills yeah endless patience good at explaining things i feel like for me it's easiest to explain with math teachers that are so good at math yeah they like skip steps and do them in their head when they're showing equations and like that's not how you teach math and that's sort of that's kind of how i feel about like hagrid he knows a lot of stuff about the animals but there's things he's going to do intuitively and not explain to the kids that could be dangerous and also because he's dealing with young kids too i just feel like dealing with young kids you're also kind of being a supervisor i just don't hagrid can't control a class like he, we see this when he's with the slytherins and the gryffindors like he can't control this with the rinse he doesn't have the amount of respect or like control needed to like mcgonagall obviously no one like plays up on her to class because she's like a respected teacher and she knows how to control a classroom but i feel like Harry doesn't have that and just kind of it's just kind of setting him up to fail i just feel like for me like he could maybe earn the respect like if he showed them that he knew a lot about animals which he does but because there's so many accidents in his class it it, it, it sort of people can't be like okay hagrid's gonna like it doesn't feel like he's there permanently it doesn't feel like you have to suck it up and treat him well if you want to graduate from hogwarts like they don't yeah i feel like he also he doesn't follow like a curriculum yeah it just seems like he just kind of shows them whatever he like thinks is cool at the time and like when he does follow a curriculum he doesn't like it because he he finds it boring but i think that like to learn students need like a routine like structure like a base that's why like i think luna says that they didn't like having hagrid and i assume it's probably because how crazy his classes were yeah i mean i can like and even the raven claws like they're they're really studious but they're also really creative and i can see how like it would be stressful to have that much chaos like it feels like Hagrid's classes are chaos like you show up and there's a cool awesome animal but like you don't know what animal you're learning about because he's surprising you so you couldn't like read about it beforehand to answer his class questions or to like ask questions questions you may have because you don't know enough about it yet to ask all those questions like the structure is hard and I feel like care of magical creatures when kids are really young to me you shouldn't be dealing with dangerous animals like 13 is really really young to be dealing with animals that are dangerous I don't know I just I think he gets too excited and he does it for the fun like what's the most fun thing we can learn about and he forgets that like half or at least a significant portion of teaching is also just like when they're kids making sure they don't kill themselves yeah it's like how Hagrid's like technically an adult but he doesn't feel like an adult no he doesn't and it's probably like he's just very like stunted because obviously he didn't graduate school and he's just been working since he's like 13 yeah it's definitely like to me if there were another teacher in that class or like a TA like a supervisor like someone like a Percy who's like a real sucker for the rules and kind of a hard ass about it to like supervise Hagrid, he could teach a great class. If there were someone there to be like, no, actually don't get closer to that animal, Harry Potter, or like Draco, take a step back or Hagrid, not that animal. <laughs> like there needs to be more oversight if they're going to let Hagrid be a teacher. And there was like none. Yeah. It does kind of show though, like the, con- the, the control Dumbledore has over the school because we see that like Hagrid's just doing whatever he kind of wants and it's not really brought up to the ministry until Fudge is kind of like, I let you do whatever you want here and you don't follow a curriculum or anything. And yeah, like- in normal schools, like you have to follow like the provincial like curriculum plan and it kind of feels like even with the monster book of monsters it's a dangerous book and not like the power of the word is dangerous in the mind like it could eat you a little bit you know yeah that should have come with a warning i think for the students and like the monster book of like if a book is that hard to read it should be maybe 
thought about whether or not it's the right choice for 13 year olds yeah i just don't think harry good was very prepared to be a teacher and he's just like he's really honored by the honor by like the honor dumbledore has given him because he didn't finish school and now he gets to be a teacher and teach something he's really passionate about but i don't think he is prepared to actually be a teacher and i, I get that dumbledore wants to like give hagrid more responsibilities to make hagrid feel more like appreciated but it feels like he could give him some things that were a little less risky why do you feel like it was very dumbledore knew like he wanted to promote harry uh, like hagrid because he didn't want to bring someone else in because i feel like dumbledore controls like the staff like they're all there for reasons and i feel like he know hagrid like basically worships the ground he walks on so he wants people there that are loyal to him and bring in like a new teacher that just doesn't have that loyalty or whatever it's like a gamble so he only brings teachers in that like have a use to him yeah for harry or just that that worship the ground he walks on so he's like why would i bring in some new person that i that doesn't respect me or care about me or i could just promote hagrid who will do anything i say so once again the priority is not the students learning the students safety the students health the students well-being oh no i thought we could just end this off talking a bit about the dementors in a bit more detail since this is like kind of like our first introduction to them and they become a really big part of the series i think my first thought is like and I think they do end up doing it, but like there should be very strict rules about like how many feet or meters a Dementor has to stay from the students because of the psychological impact they have on students, like especially teenagers going through puberty and stuff like that. Imagine being a person who is clinically depressed. I can imagine then having a thing that's basically clinically depression lurking over you like it would be so bad and i just don't think they put enough precautions in place and i get they get mad when the dementors get too close and stuff but there needs to be more of a set very very sturdy boundary of how close they can be because i want the students to be safe but psychologically and well-being wise as well as physically just not dead yeah i think it kind of shows like how Cornelius is kind of dealing with the situation where he doesn't really consider like anyone else the public relations he's just considering just like getting serious black back because it's making him look bad he wants the dementors everywhere but Dumbledore's kind of like, actually, these things are kind of terrible. I don't want them near me. I also kind of think, like, I wonder why they went to Harry's compartment. Like, do we think they, like, sensed the horror crook insides of Harry and was like, oh, there's something dark and evil in here? Do we think they sensed Peter Pettigrew and, like, his malicious intent? Or do we think they were just opening doors? <laughs> Doesn't Sirius say that they're, like, blind so they can't actually see? But I think that because they're looking for Sirius Black, but I think because they, like, the re reason why they just affect Harry so much is because he has such trauma in his life. It's like delicious to them or whatever. They like, they live. Oh, they were just, he smelled good. Yeah, they suck on it. And like, they, they could just, I guess they were looking for Sirius and they're like, wait a minute. And they just see all this trauma and they're just like, this is too delicious to turn down. Which is also like the reason why like they were like around the Quidditch pitch and stuff with, later on in the series. I just feel like around Harry, they, they just can't help themselves. Which is why they're so dangerous, because we can see that the Ministry doesn't really have control over them. They kind of do, do, they do what they want. Yeah, like they're teasing the Dementors. No wonder they're going to switch sides at some point. Like, they're being taunted. They're like, here's some miserable children, don't get too close. Yeah, exactly. It's like wafting fresh baked bread in the window of their house. So I guess my final Dementor thoughts for this chapter are a little bit like, why? I get it. I get that Dementors are scary, and I understand... That, like, by diminishing the, like, will of prisoners in Azkaban, it reduces the likelihood of escapes and plotting future crimes or whatever. Fine. But why are they the ones who are assigned to do out of the school business? Like, to me, like, have them on call and if you find Sirius Black, you call in some Dementors. Fine. But they should not be the ones doing this job. Like, there should be Oros. Not, like, controllable, legally can be held responsible for their actions, trained Oros, should be walking around Hogwarts, should be looking at the train. And it's using the Dementors, it almost feels like Fudge chose that because everyone is afraid of the Dementors and saying I've released the Dementors to handle this makes it sound so extreme. Like it's like the nuclear level solution. Yeah, I do think that it's it's for him to look good. Yeah, not practical though. Because it's also the fact that like no one's escaped from this prison. So it's just like this big unknown thing. And it, it causes fear. And the fact that everyone assumes Sirius is super crazy and this crazy murderer who's like basically dead or Voldemort. And so he wants some, like the biggest, baddest thing out there to make it look like he's doing something good. When really, I don't know if it's actually good. Probably just more harm than good. Yeah, I would think so. I mean, they don't really help. Yeah, so I think that's pretty much it. 
Do you have anything else? Um, my preferred dark brooding cloaked creature at Hogwarts is Severus Snape, and I like to keep it that way. <laughs> cool. Thank you for listening to this episode of Potter Revisited, and we'll be back next time to discuss Chapter 6 of Prisoner of Azkaban, Talons and Tea Leaves. Finally getting into some new classes, which will be fun. I'm hyped for divination. Yep, if you have any thoughts about today's episode, you can email us at potterrevisitedpodcast at gmail.com or reach out to us on social media at potterrevisited, and we will see you next time. Bye! Bye.